The federal government has reached an agreement with Kinder Morgan. Tonight, $4.5 billion later, Canada becomes the owner of a massive pipeline expansion project. Canada's Auditor General casts shade on this government's claim that it's improving the lives of Indigenous peoples. The deaths of Wendy Carlick, Sarah McIntosh, and others have devastated our communities. And charges laid for two murders in Whitehorse, Yukon. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. The federal government is pushing through its plans to move the Kinder Morgan pipeline forward. Today it announced what some call an unfortunate and unprecedented step. Here's Annette Francis with that story. The announcement to reporters came first thing this morning. Canada will work with investors to transfer the project and related assets to a new owner or owners in a way that ensures that the project's construction and operation will proceed in a manner that protects the public interest. The Minister of Finance says the message today is simple. When faced with a situation that puts Canada's international reputation on the line and jobs at risk, his government will take action. To guarantee the summer construction season for the workers who are counting on it and to ensure the project is built to completion in a timely fashion, the federal government has reached an agreement with Kinder Morgan to purchase the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline and the infrastructure related to the Trans Mountain expansion project. Bill Morneau announced Canada will buy the Kinder Morgan pipeline for $4.5 billion and will allow the project to proceed under the new ownership of a Crown Corporation. Canada will work with investors to transfer the project and related assets to a new owner or owners in a way that ensures that the project's construction and operation will proceed in a manner that protects the public interest. Green Party leader Elizabeth May says the federal government backed itself into a corner. If the federal court of appeal rules that indigenous rights weren't respected, then the constitutional rights of indigenous peoples completely uh, it trumps the, uh, the federal government's claim that because we own it, it's now federal jurisdiction. It was federal jurisdiction without us owning it. But as of August, when the closing date arrives, Canada will be the owner of this infrastructure. According to Conservative leader Andrew Scheer, it's going to cost taxpayers more in the long run. We know the government is imposing new regulations in forms of a carbon tax. We don't know how that will be applied to this project. So that's why I say $4.5 billion, that's just the down payment on the total investment, that the, that, on the total spending that's going to be required on this. And it's coming out of taxpayers' money, and it was completely unnecessary. Morneau says the ownership transfer will take place in August, and any existing profit-sharing agreements between Kinder Morgan and Indigenous groups will remain in effect. Annette Francis, APT National News, Ottawa. With the Liberal government dishing out $4.5 billion for the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion, APTN's Tina House has reaction from British Columbia. Where the pipeline will transport nearly a million barrels a day from the tar sands to Burnaby. Kinder Morgan Canada held a telephone conference from their Calgary office to discuss the buyout. Kinder Morgan Canada has reached an agreement with the government of Canada that will result in the sale of the existing Trans Mountain system and the Trans Mountain expansion project for $4.5 billion Canadian. This is a great day for Canada, for our customers and for our employees. We've agreed to a fair price for our shareholders and we've found a way forward for this national interest project. For Will George, who's been at the watch house for the last three months, he says this doesn't change anything and they will be ramping up their efforts. When I received that phone call, you know, um, a lot of emotions tied into that call. Uh, one being very sad about it and, uh, and upset and angry. So. You know, for him to choose to spend $4.5 billion on this pipeline and, and bail out a, a Texas-based company uh, when there's clearly not enough drinking water for most nations across Canada. B.C. Uh, Premier John Horgan says the province will continue to battle the pipeline in the courts. Both governments have professed to uh, embrace the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Both governments have uh, professed to embrace genuine reconciliation, and I'm not convinced you can ne necessarily do that uh, when you're disregarding uh, the rights of uh, uh, Indigenous groups uh, along a, a power corridor. 
The B.C. government is still pursuing its reference case to see if they have jurisdiction over what flows in B.C. However, according to Alberta Premier Rachel Notley, because it will be a federally owned pipeline, that could have a major impact on that reference case. As a result of the pipeline having been purchased by the federal government, they uh, have a form of crown immunity, which actually uh, makes a limits the degree to which uh, provincial laws would apply to the project because it's a federal project now. Chief Ernie Cray of the Cheam First Nation in BC is also delighted about the news. For First Nations like mine it means a great, a great deal. We're happy that this project is going forward because we have formed uh, joint partnerships with local businesses here in the Fraser Valley and some national organizations. We've already started work associated with the pipeline. The government is seeking to have a third party buy the pipeline by July the 22nd. But if they don't find one, the Canadian taxpayers will still continue to pay Kinder Morgan the $4.5 billion. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. In other news today, the Auditor General Spring Report was released. And two of the seven reports are of particular interest to Indigenous peoples. One was on socioeconomic gaps on First Nations and the other on employment training. Joining me now from Ottawa is the Auditor General of Canada, Michael Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson, thanks for taking some time to join us. Thank you. Let's start with the socioeconomic gaps on First Nations and what did the audit find in that area? So what we looked at there was, you know, how the government measures the socioeconomic gap between First Nations people living on reserve um, and other people living in Canada. So trying to understand, you know, what, what, how do you look at that socioeconomic gap? How do you measure it? How do you know how big it is? And then how do you reduce it? What we found was really the government does not have a good way of measuring the socioeconomic gap um, to, to understand exactly whether the condition of people living on reserve is, getting, is, getting, is improving compared to the conditions of other people in the country. What, we've, what we looked at specifically was uh, education results, for example, and we found um, significant differences in education results. Um, the Department uh, of, of uh, Indigenous Services identifies that uh, 49 percent of on-reserve First Nations uh, high school students who start grade 12, only 49 percent of them actually complete grade 12 within that year. Um, we went back and looked at uh, First Nations on-reserve students who started grade 9 and found that only 25 percent of them complete grade 12 four years later on. So those are, those are results that are much worse than for um, other populations in Canada. Um, you know, and when, when only 25% of students that start grade 9 can complete grade 12 within, within that four-year time period. Um, so we identified a number of different issues there that indicate that the socioeconomic gap is not only not understood, uh, there doesn't seem to be indications that the socioeconomic gap is reducing. What would be your recommendations to, uh, I guess, get some better data on that? Well, I think the first thing, again, and all of this needs to be done working with First Nations groups, First Nations organizations, uh, is to understand what is the objective, um, you know, what, what are the important components of the socioeconomic gaps. And First Nations people told us that that needs to include things like culture and language as well. Um, to, to understand what the condition is of people on First Nations. Uh, the Department of, uh, of Indigenous Services does have what they call a Community Well-Being Index, which does look at some aspects uh, of conditions on First Nations reserves. And in that, first, in that uh, Community Well-Being Index, they have identified that out of the 100 worst off um, communities in Canada, 98 of them are First Nations communities. Wow. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Not a surprise there, I guess. Uh, let's move to employment training, something we hear a lot about. What are some of the highlights in this report? Well, so this, these are, we looked at a couple of, of programs that uh, the Department of um, Employment um, uh, ser Services does, uh, particularly aimed at, uh, at Indigenous people. They spend over $350 million a year, or about $350 million a year, trying to help Indigenous people find meaningful and sustainable employment. 
Um, but again, there's no definition of what sustainable em employment means. So what they know is, well, first of all, they don't have any information, again, on 22% of the Indigenous people that get services under these programs, services that are supposed to help them be able to find that meaningful, sustainable employment. Um, of the rest of them, they do know that a number of people, Indigenous people, do eventually find employment after receiving these services that the department pays for, um, but they don't know whether it is long-term, sustainable, meaningful employment, or whether it's just very short-term, working a few days on a project. Um, so, they, so the department really needs to understand uh, you know, what the outcomes are. We went through and analyzed their data and we, uh, we identified things like apprenticeship programs seem to be a good way of helping Indigenous people find um, employment. Uh, we also found, though, that about 16% of the Indigenous people who get services under these programs um, actually receive five or more services. So are, they actually, are all of those services actually leading to sustainable employment is what the department needs to figure out. Mr. Ferguson, always uh, interesting reports. Appreciate you taking some time for us here today. Thank you. Appreciate your interest. The Nunavut government has delivered their latest budget, and the territory will run a planned deficit of at least $28 million. Finance Minister David Akiagok, Akiagok tabled the budget yesterday at Nunavut's Legislative Assembly. The reason for the deficit? According to the finance minister, Nunavut's poverty is expensive to manage. We can address only small parts of the large social deficits that has been accumulating since long before Nunavut's creation. Mr. Speaker, running a back-to-back -back fiscal deficit is manageable, but not something we plan to sustain. Hearings for the proposed 60 scoop settlement are continuing today in Toronto. We'll take you there for the latest after the break. Here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Sunny and 22 in Fredericton. Rain and plus 4 for St. John's. A rainy high of 19 in La Grande. Sunny and 13 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. 10 under the sun in Septiel, 28 in Val d'Or, 29 in Sarnia, North Bay in Toronto, 32 in Peterborough, rain and 25 for Wawa, showers and 24 in Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, 20 for Flin Flon and Norway House, a rainy day to the south, 21 in Winnipeg, 20 in Dauphin. In Saskatchewan, rain and 26 in Regina, showers and 22 in Saskatoon, rain and 15 in Meadow Lake, rain and 19 in La Ronge. Welcome back. Yukon RCMP have made an arrest in the 2017 double homicide of Wendy Carlick and Sarah McIntosh. Yesterday, a 44-year-old. Everett Chief, an Indigenous man originally from Watson Lake, Yukon, was charged with two counts of second-degree murder. Now the charge related to the death of Wendy Carlick has been upgraded to first-degree murder. Shirley McLean has the latest. It's a somber mood at the Kualandun First Nation government offices today as they digest the news that an Indigenous man has been charged with taking the lives of 53-year-old Sarah McIntosh and 51-year-old Wendy Carlick. The deaths of Wendy Carlick, Sarah McIntosh and others have devastated our communities. They've left us with a feeling of helplessness as there are many, so many, unanswered questions. Both women were found dead in the Whitehorse home of McIntosh on April 19th of 2017. Sarah was a member of the Kualandun First Nation in Whitehorse and Wendy was a member of the Casca Nation in northern British Columbia. Chief Doris Bill says there is some sense of relief. We will move forward. We will do what we can. We will continue to be proactive and, and, and to, um, you know, put in place the supports and the programs that are needed to ensure that we have a safe community. But we will take care of each other. 
44-year-old Everett Chief. In a video statement posted to Facebook on May 28th, the commanding officer of the Yukon RCMP stated this investigation was not easy. These investigations are exceptionally complex and they take significant resources and time. I would like to thank the families and community leaders for their patience and understanding. The Kualandan First Nation is taking an active role in supporting the community and family members with helping the police solve other cold cases related to the First Nation. I hope the families of Wendy and Sarah maintain faith that we can uncover the truth of what happened to them. And let us remember there are other homicides yet to be resolved. Alan Waugh, Greg Dawson, Wendy's daughter, Angel Carlick, and others. Everett Chief remains in custody. His first appearance in Yukon Court was held earlier this morning and has been adjourned till June 15th. Chief was seen wiping away tears as one of Sarah McIntosh's daughters yelled out, I hope you rot in hell. You stole my mother from me as she left the courtroom in hysterics. Family has confirmed to APTN that Chief is related to Wendy Carlick and he was in some form of relationship with Sarah McIntosh. Upon further investigation, the RCMP have pumped up the charges of second degree murder to first degree in the case of Wendy Carlick. The investigation is continuing. Shirley McLean, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Now to Alberta, where after decades of waiting, the province has apologized for their role in the 60s scoop. The Legislative Assembly Premier Rachel Notley said Alberta is sorry for their role in the thousands of Indigenous children taken from their homes. APTN's Chris Stewart brings us the story. From the 1950s to the 1990s, up to 25,000 Indigenous children across Canada were taken from their families. They were put into adoption or foster care in other parts of the country and even across the globe. It broke up happy families and deprived the children of their culture. Monday at the legislature, Alberta Premier Rachel Notley formally apologized for the province's role. From all of us here as the elected representatives of the people of Alberta and on behalf of the government of Alberta, we are sorry for the loss of families, of stability, of love, we are sorry. For the loss of identity, of language and culture, we are sorry. Hundreds of spectators, many of whom are 60 Scoop survivors, gathered at the legislature to witness the apology. We will work with Indigenous communities, with each of you, we will ensure your perspectives, your desires, and your priorities for your, for your families and communities are reflected in what we do going forward. No one knows what Indigenous children and families need better than First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities. We will honour that. Ministers Daniel Lirvey and Richard Fian heard firsthand stories from survivors. The Children's Services and Indigenous Relations Ministries worked with the 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta and heard personal stories from almost 1,000 survivors. It was incredibly moving. Uh, it's been a moving throughout the whole entire process of hearing the stories from survivors of, of their loss, of their abuse, uh, and, and all of the challenges that they, they face then and continue to face. After the apology, the president of the 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta, Adam North Pegan, accepted the apology with the caveat. On behalf of the 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta, Premier Notley, we accept your, accept your apology with the understanding that it is, this is only the beginning. Reconciliation begins with sincere apology. There is so much more work to do and we are going to continue to keep the government of Alberta and Premier Rachel Notley accountable. Alberta is the second province to offer an apology. Manitoba's government apologized for their role in the 60s scoop in 2015. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Now, the proposed 60 Scoop settlement was approved by a Saskatoon judge earlier this month. Today, the Ontario Superior Court heard arguments from lawyers included in the agreement and those opposing it. 
Some survivors spoke at the Toronto hearings. APTN's Beverly Andrews brings us the details. The issue before the course today was whether to accept or deny the proposed 60 Scoop settlement. Marcia Brown-Mattel was the first plaintiff to seek compensation for 60 Scoop survivors from Canada. The judge had issue with the $25,000 to $50,000 compensation package for survivors, thinking it wasn't enough. He asked survivors in the courtroom what they thought. Many agreed that it probably wasn't enough, but recognizes a more symbolic gesture from Canada to help them move on and to help with reconciliation. Like I'm here for one reason, as I want to make sure that I, I have a say and I, I, I'm going to agree with uh, what's happening here today. But I think like $50,000 in my case, anyway, with uh, with my family and my grandkids, grandkids, you know, I I could do a lot with that little fifty thousand dollars that are offering us today. The other major concern for the judge was the seventy-five million dollars allocated for lawyer fees. He could not reconcile this as a reasonable amount. He asked the lawyers on both sides if they'd be willing to take the rest of the day to discuss a more reasonable amount and bring that back to the courtroom tomorrow. I think that there's a reasonable amount that they should award the the lawyers, but I think $75 million is, is excessive. So I'm thinking that they should come up with a reasonable amount that everyone's happy with. Some survivors fear that by denying the settlement, it would undo all the work the courts have done and they'd have to start from scratch. The Lawyers for Canada said they are willing to discuss any and all matters and come to agreement that is suitable for everyone. Court reconvenes on Wednesday. Beverly Andrews, APTN National News, Toronto. Time for another quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Here's the rest of Wednesday's weather outlook. Picking back up in northern Alberta, 14 for Fort McMurray and Peace River. Rain in a high of only 11 in Edmonton, 12 in Red Deer, 13 in Calgary. On the west coast, 15 in Victoria, 17 in Vancouver, 12 in Port Hardy, showers and 12 in Prince George, a rainy high of 13 in Smithers, in the Yukon, 14 in Whitehorse, Beaver Creek and Rock River, over to NWT, sunny and 5 in Fort Resolution, 8 in Yellowknife and Ray Lakes, minus 3 in Saks Harbor, 2 above in Politech, 19 under the sun in Fort McPherson, in Nunavut, plus 3 in Arviette, one above in Whale Cove, minus one with snow in Clyde River, minus four in Resolute. Welcome back. Roseanne Barr has lost her hit new show and apologized today for a racist tweet she has since deleted. In it, she made a racist remark about former White House advisor under President Obama, Valerie Jarrett. Barr issued an apology saying she was truly sorry for making a bad joke about her politics and her looks. She says she should have known better and the joke was in bad taste. She then said she's leaving Twitter. Jarrett had advised Barack and Michelle Obama during their time in the White House. ABC confirmed the show has been cancelled. And that's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For more on the government's planned buyout of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Be sure to join us tomorrow live at 2 p.m. Central for In Focus. We've got quite a panel joining us, including the host of The Laughing Drum, Tim Fontaine. He's up next with the season finale of the show. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.